Perfect. So we are recording. I'm super excited to have Erica here on the first kind of official episode of Fat Girls Coping. I think that it'll be just better to do them on Zoom so that I can upload them and people can watch them whenever. Um, I am Annette. I am the chick behind Fat Girls Traveling and From Annette with Love. And my guest today is Erica. And why don't you introduce yourself, Erica? Hey, um, all. I am Erica. I am an 11th grade humanities teacher out in Oakland, California. Um, I love Harry Potter and lifting weights. <laughs> Yay. So I am super excited to have Erica on the show today because I wanted to chat with her specifically about being a teacher and like working from home and um, obviously being like a high school teacher. I think that's a little more um, tricky to do <laughs> from home just because uh, I think it would be difficult for me as a teenager to like focus in on high school if I didn't have to be in class. Um, and so I'm trying to figure out how you're navigating that, how you're just like coping in life with this whole, you know, right now you're in the Bay Area, I'm in the Bay Area, and so they're calling it shelter in place, which I think they just extended, right, to like June something if fourth. Oh, wow. I, I heard the last thing that I had officially heard was that it had been extended to May 4th. I didn't know that they pushed it back even further. Yeah. I know so, that the schools are <laughs> They have no more school in person until the fall so yeah which is crazy um yeah gavin newsom did announce that it was going to be until like june now the shelter in place so Oof. fun <laughs> so yeah, now that the schools are closed like how like walk us through a day now like how was your day now different from like your day when you were going into the school every morning yeah so personally there's um a lot less um, stress, you know, like when you, when I get into school, school starts at 8.30. Um, I'm usually there between 7.30 and 8. And the moment you walk through the door, you're kind of, you're on and you're prepping and you're interacting with students. Um, maybe I had breakfast, maybe I didn't. So in terms, like in terms of those kind of logistical things, I can get up in the morning and I can have breakfast and, and those things are easier. What's definitely, um, harder is being able to get to have like continue to build relationships with students when you can't see them, um, being able to, to support them with what they're going through academically, but also whatever is going on, you know, socially, emotionally. Um, those are the things that this whole thing, um, that it complicates. So I get up in the morning and I send out like a check-in question. Sometimes they're um, serious and like wanting to know how they're doing um, and how their family is coping. Other times they're really silly. Like the one this morning is, um, would you rather a stranger lick your foot or you lick your best friend's foot? Like, it's just like, I Googled the <laughs> would you rather question. I do, um, I do a lot of those, um, those memes where it has like nine different Beyonce's and it's like, which Beyonce are you today? So I check in with them. It's how I take attendance. And then I'm just available for, um, I'm available for, you know, clarifying questions. I get a lot of emails from students throughout the day. They sign up for um, phone calls where I, you know, once a week I call and, and they get personal time with me to ask questions and to see how they're doing and that kind of thing. So that's, that's how my day goes. That's great. I think that um, for me, some of my fondest memories of like teachers was definitely in high school. And that's something that actually you and I share. We both had the same was for me, he was like history and geography or something. He did like two uh, different grade levels of um, teaching. Um, and then I was his TA one year, but Mr. Coleman and we found out we're friends on Facebook but we found out that we like both had Mr. Coleman as a teacher and we both are yeah. friends with him on Facebook and that's how we figured it out. <laughs> yes, he was my, I can't remember. I think it was ninth 
ninth and tenth grade history teacher? Girl, I mean, <laughs> <laughs> I've been out of school for for so long. I don't even remember now. But, but yeah. But that's crazy that like now we're both in our thirties and we're still we're Facebook friends, you know, with our ninth and I think it was like yeah maybe it was ninth and tenth grade for me and then my uh, th my junior year I think I was his TA or something so like we're still friends with and like you know socially connected with a teacher that we had in high school I think those relationships are really important and I think that it's cool that you're like doing the work to um to do that because especially I think that um and like you said you work in oakland i'm sure most of the kids there are like children of color people of color and i feel that like just even at that age it's difficult to trust people because you're learning to trust yourself just as a teenager um but i think that it's so important to build those like connections with an adult in your life as a teenager someone that's gonna like help guide you um and you shared some of the stuff that like some of the other that some of the kids are dealing with on top of this big whole change with uh like staying at home and um studying from abroad can you kind of explain that to the viewers yeah. so i mean i think um i've got um a few students who i definitely know like struggle with depression um and um i think i'm i'm a little nervous um for one student in particular um because like she tends to like retreat and stay home when things are not going well and so sheltering in place is a lot like what happens when she's feeling you know when she's feeling depressed so i'm a little bit worried about for her and for several other students like what's happening at home um and what kind of support they're getting at home um definitely students worrying about getting you know having access to food um students who count on getting breakfast and lunch from school families that count on that and now they have to um now they have to provide that meal for their family and do they have the money to do that um and then uh, a few a few weeks ago about a about a month ago um our school suffered a loss where one of our students um unfortunately was uh fatally stabbed and while I didn't have that strong of a connection with that student, um, several of my of my students um, were friends with him. So it's like just shining a light on the fact that teachers do so much more than assign schoolwork, <laughs> you know, and that we serve so many different. Um, different roles in students' lives, and all of these things are happening to them, and we're not there to help them process, you know, when, when, for me, when 9-11 happened when I was in high school, I still had my teachers being able to explain things to me and to, to listen to me, um, and, and they don't really, they don't have that, not in person, you know, we've got text and email, but it's not really the same, so that's so true because i actually i was in high school too when 9 11 happened and um it was kind of nice like i was in school like it happened during the school day and and like all of a sudden they were like wheeling in tvs into like every classroom and we were all like watching like what's gonna happen next like everything stopped um but it did feel not as lonely just because we were all in it together you know what I mean? Like we were all in that class together and all kind of experiencing it together. And now that I think about this, this is definitely more isolating, but it's a completely type of attack. You know what I mean? It's a virus. And so the way to stay safe in this situation is to be isolated from other people. But the other point that actually really stuck with me is you were just saying like some of your uh, students not having access to stuff. Like I remember um, I'm, you know, I'm in my 30s, but when I was in high school, we didn't have access, I didn't have access to a computer at home. You know what I mean? Like, if I had to type something or print something, I went to the computer lab and like did all of that type stuff there. So yeah. I'm sure that also might be an issue. Like, luckily with Zoom, like you are on your phone and I am on my computer. And so now with Zoom, there's ways that you can like make things work. 
but is that also a challenge? Is everyone um, of your students have access to the technology needed to like complete all these assignments? Definitely that that is a prop what is was a problem for lots of schools. Um, I had students who were trying to do all of this you know, look at Google Docs, be on Google Classroom and do all this stuff on on their phone, you know, um, with the cracked screen that's, bit, you know, that's this big. And it was, it was definitely showing in the quality of their work and in their just willingness to do some of these assignments. So um, what we did was we, you know, we opened up we have Chromebooks at the school, so we opened up the Chromebook carts and, you know, students were able to come in at certain points throughout the week and, you know, grab, grab a Chromebook, sign a little, you know, a contract so that they can take care of it. Um, and so that was one hurdle. The other hurdle is around Wi-Fi um, access and, you know, is their home wired for Wi-Fi? Um, are they using their phone as a hotspot, which is not, um, uh, you know, it's not as, as reliable in, in, com you know, compared to, to having like a router in the home. So it's, it's a, it's a struggle. It's one of the reasons why I try to give students as much slack as possible. You've probably seen me post like little comments and messages that students, you know, can I please have a baby extension? And I'm like, girl, yes. <laughs> you know, um, I'm not about to be. Uh, <laughs> That's hilarious. <laughs> I'm not about to, to be the same way that I might, you know, during the school year where I'm like, no, nah, like you're not getting an extension. So I'm, I'm trying to be very flexible um, with students through all of this because of those things. Yeah, that's so true. And like, it is kind of like, even just like the structure of a school is its own kind of space away from the home. Like I said, if I needed to do homework or something, go to the library or go to the computer lab if you have to type something. But like if you're having to do all that stuff in your home and combat all the noise and the distractions and little brothers and all these different things that you're dealing with as a teenager. Um, and, you know, obviously at that point, your brain is still developing. You don't have the skills to be able to multitask as well as you would by now. You know what I mean? At my age, hopefully. <laughs> but, uh, lots, girl, lots, lots of the students are like, I, when this, I want to come back to school. My mom keeps bugging me, you know, like they, there are some of them that really miss that the structure that school provides because they know that they, they don't work well at home. It's too much distraction. Um, and then there are some students who, I have a student, um, Angel, who is like, I feel like a boss at home. I like this. <laughs> um, so, so it, 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 I'm getting a, I'm seeing some students who are really shining. Um, in, in this structure, they're figuring out ways to, to be successful um, despite all of this, so. That's what's up. Um, another thing that I was actually just talking to uh, my best friend about is just like all of the like rituals that unfortunately the students in your grade um, and like the one grade above are gonna have to miss this year. And I'm sure like when I was a junior, I was still, I was applying for college. You know what I mean? I got early acceptance into college in my junior year, but I went to like fashion school. But like, there's all these things that you're- I didn't know you're... that. Oh my what? goodness. I didn't know you went to fashion school. Yeah, I went to FITM. I lived in LA for like five years and worked in the fashion industry and did that whole thing. Um, so yeah, but that- <laughs> Ah, oh, thanks, Will. But no, there's all these things like prom and like, I don't know if you guys already had homecoming, like all these different things that you have in high school that create memories. And like, obviously for seniors, graduation, all of that kind of stuff. 
Is that something that the kids are bringing up to you? I don't know why I'm yeah. saying kids. They're like young adults. <laughs> uh, you know what I mean? Like, should I be like, are the young adults saying this to you? Like, <laughs> you know, they are still, they are still babies in my eyes. Um, they, uh, I feel so badly for our seniors. Um, you know, we, we do quite a few things that are a little bit different. Um, because we are a charter school, so obviously there's graduation, but we do um, pre presentations of learning, which we call PLLs, where we invite people in from the community um, to serve on panels, and so uh, students present what they have learned in um, throughout the school year. They show their work, they talk about their areas of growth, where they've succeeded, where they still need to, you know, um, keep working and um, why they are ready to go to the next grade level. And people from the community, uh, you know, ask them questions and the kids get all dressed up and they're in their suits and their, you know, dresses and skirts and things like that. So we won't be able to do that. Seniors do this thing called um, fire walks where these really small uh, spaces where they tell their stories and they talk about their journeys. Um, and as you feel when you're in the, the the circle, as you feel moved that this young person is ready to go on, you stand up and like that's how they pass this firewalk test. Um, oh my god, that's yeah. amazing! <laughs> I want one, girl. I'm about to cry, and I'm I've never even <laughs> seen it, and I want one now. Like, can we do one? Like, damn, that's so amazing. That's yeah. so cool. We have wow. We have a senior breakfast. All the teachers get, we all dress up in like black pants and white shirts and we serve the seniors breakfast. And they, um, the, everybody in the school is there. Um, the new incoming students, they get a key on like a little chain and basically to symbolize that like you're a part of this community. You always have a key here. You can always come home. Um, the seniors do, we have this bell, like a old fireman bell. And so when the seniors leave, they ring the bell to, you know, to signal like that they're moving on. So all of these rituals that are really amazing and beautiful, obviously culminating in graduation, they just, like, I don't know how how we're going to to make that up are we gonna we haven't talked about what we're gonna do virtually are we gonna do something once we come back from the fall i can't imagine that we won't try to to make these things up you know to them in in some kind of way but it's really heartbreaking that they won't get it um you know now when they're here because so many of them are going to go off and do other things so yeah, that's such a bummer. And yeah, I think it's important that we kind of acknowledge that. And like, you know, I think, yeah, I think that if I were a student right now, I would be super bummed about it. But it would also be even a bigger bummer if people tried to like minimize those like rituals and those traditions that um, fortunately, I have had those opportunities. And I do have those memories. And I think that if I were in that position, it would just suck not to have, you know, but it has been cool. I have been seeing online, like parents doing like creating like a little prom at home and different oh. things like that. Yeah. So that's kind of cute. Like our girls, I saw on TikTok, a girl like uh, dressed up in her like prom outfit and was like, I'm never going to be able to wear this. So like to real prom. So I'm going to wear it now. And I was like, yes, girl, get your wear, get your yes. wear in there. You know what I mean? And she looked really cute. Um, so I feel like, you know, we're, we're pivoting and we're having to adjust and, um, we just have to have a little bit of compassion for like what everyone else is going through. And I think that obviously chatting with you about this is going to give people a little more of a light into like what the high school and the young adults are the high school students and the young adults are doing and having to go through right now, because I'm pretty removed from that. I don't have anyone in my life. That's like that age, you know? Um, so it's nice to be able to talk to like teachers and people that are in that space. Uh, but like, Besides what you're doing for the kids, like, what are you doing for you? Like, how are you coping with all your free time and, uh, you know, not driving yourself crazy with obviously <laughs> having to change up your whole life and your whole schedule? And how are you coping? 
Yeah, um, I came, what's really interesting is before we got the official order to shelter in place, I took three days off from work because I was feeling, man, like I was, I was feeling like just burnt out and not like I felt like I was doing everything at like 60%, you know, I wasn't doing anything really well. Um, so I took a few days off to try to, um, you know, get myself back together. Um, so I think I had a little bit of a head start to like sit down and create a plan. So the the Capricorn in me, like I literally took out my planner and wrote out things that I, that I, ways that I wanted to use my time. And, um, and so one of the things that was really important to me was um, creating morning and nighttime rituals for myself. Um, and like getting sleep under control and putting electronics away at a certain time. So for the last week, and hopefully it continues, no electronics an hour before bed. So I'm done looking at screens um, by, by nine o'clock. Um, I've been meeting, still meeting with my trainer. So being able to move and um, she dropped off some weights to me. So I've been able to still lift some weights um, and projects around the house. I built myself a vanity. It took half the night. Um, I saw you posted that on <laughs> Facebook. It was so cute. Good Girl, job, at, boo. I looked at those instructions and I was like, I have no idea what where things are supposed to go. I messed up. There's, there's st the drawer is a little bit off track. So I mean, but you know, it's like it costs one hundred and seventy dollars. It's like pressed particle board you know what i mean like yeah <laughs> it, <laughs> it is what it is it's standing it's pretty um so yeah so doing things like that i'm gonna hang new curtains um so that's how i've been cooking i've been cooking i was a little burnt out and and ordered food um a couple of days ago but um but i've been cooking i'm gonna try some baking recipes next week so that's how i've been keeping myself going that's what's up what have you been watching on netflix i know i've been seeing some of your posts we've been watching some of the similar stuff but anything good um, what are you loving or hulu watched, or whatever i have it all um and i watched like everybody else in america tiger king um and then which is it's still tripping me out all these weeks later. Such a train um, wreck, right? I love it, though. Like, it's horrible, but it's such a train wreck. And, like, I don't know. Maybe I'll get your opinion on this. I've actually been asking my friends what they think because, you know, I have an opinion about everything. But <laughs> basically, I've been seeing all these posts recently about people being like, if you liked Tiger King, you're a horrible person. And, like, these whole, like, think pieces about tiger king i literally think that tiger king is like the housewives of like zookeepers you know what i mean because <laughs> i am not down with any type of animal tourism or like zoos or any of that kind of stuff uh but it's interesting i watch tiger king because my life is such a hot piling sh heap of garbage that i had to like watch something else that made me feel better about my existence you know what i mean and i'm not going to apologize for that but like it's so interesting to see all these like articles and like think pieces about if you watch Tiger King, you're like a soulless individual who doesn't care about animals. It's like, sorry, no, I am not freaking Carol Baskin or, wow. <laughs> or Joe Exotic. Like I just watched what happened. That happened like 10 years ago as well. If I could change it, I would. When I have my money, I don't support those places ever. You know what I mean? So I don't know. What do you think about that? I think, like, to say that if you watched it, you're a soulless individual. Like, to me, that's that's just way too dramatic. Come up, come off of your moral high horse. Um, but I do think that there are people that um, are overlooking some of the more detrimental aspects of these characters. Like, Joe was a predator. He preyed on those boys. And he chose young boys who were addicted to drugs, and he used that 
um, to manipulate them into these relationships. So I don't think watching it makes you bad. If you are somehow leaving, you know, the, once you're done, you somehow think that Joe is a good person and like you sympathize with him, then maybe we might have to talk about your moral compass. Um, but just, uh, you know, we watch a lot of things where bad things happen all of the time. It doesn't mean that we are automatically bad. It, it's about what you take away from it and like, you know. Definitely. How. And I think it is more of a conversation of like, okay, so now 90% of the world has watched this. Like, this is, you know, this is what I took away from it. And this is what I hope you took away from it. Instead of it being like, this is what I thought. And if you didn't think that you're a soulless individual or something like, I'm just like, come on, bro. But, you know, but it's also, the, people are so like bored too. Exactly. And people are hella bored. They have nothing else to do but to watch Tiger King and then write about it. Like, you, it doesn't matter. People are going to write their thing pieces and, you know, and that's just kind of like the nature of, you know, the 21st century now is just uh, everybody thinks that they that they know the right thing with a capital R. And if you if you don't align with that, then you're clearly the worst person in the entire world. Um, and it's like, whoa, 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 whoa. I listen, I'm ready to judge and read and cancel right along with you but let's, <laughs> it's got to be it's got to be cause for it it has to be legitimate you know so definitely i watched platform that was kind of a trip did you ever see that one? Oh no i watched um b stars which is the strangest one of the strangest animes i've ever seen in my entire life but no i didn't see platform <laughs> No, uh, so V Star. I've not. It's it's anime. Is it on Netflix as well, it's, or what is it on? It's on Netflix. It's called like B Stars, and it's these animals, but they're like like animals. It's I don't even know how to describe it. It's really trippy. Um, like it, it, I was done watching it, and I was like, okay, like what did I just? I don't know why did I do this. Like I could have. What did I just watch? Else. Yeah, I was like, I, the funny just get naked. Like it's so weird. That's crazy. crazy. No platform is actually really good. It's about this kind of. It's kind of like a prison, but this guy goes into it. Like the main character goes into it as kind of like a researcher. You know what I mean? Um, and but it's kind of like a prison where each person is on a level. Um, of this kind of like prison so they're on the whatever 49th floor um, and there's a hundred floors and when the food comes it starts at the hundredth floor and then it goes down each floor um, and basically each floor is called a platform you know what I mean and so mm -hmm. basically it's about this guy who's like this researcher who goes in and he learns that that's how the food is rationed like the people at the top get the most and the people at the bottom, if there's anything, then that's what you get. You just get what you get and you don't say shit, you know? Um, and so he tries to go on this kind of almost like a socialist thing where he feels like he needs to tell everyone else on their different platforms to only take enough for themselves so that they can ration it and everyone can have some. So it's definitely a trip. It's a trip. Um, and it's one of those Netflix movies that obviously, like, wasn't originally made in English, but they got old mm -hmm. dude and old girl to, like, do the dub over. So, like, the words are, like, the mouth is, like, hi. You know what I mean? <laughs> but, <laughs> but it's really good, though. It's really good. But it's definitely What's not. The, what is it originally? What language is it originally in? Girl, I don't know. I just watched the movie, but I don't, I don't know who, where it's from originally. <laughs> But it's a movie. It's not like a show. It's just, it's a movie. Okay. So it's nice. You don't have to like commit too much. You know what I mean? Because when you get into a series, you're like yeah. committing for life. I'm That's check a, that out. Yeah. Because that, that sounds like something I would definitely watch. I did, while I was putting my vanity together, I watched How to Fix a Drug Scandal. Um, that's oh, on I never heard of um, this. What I is would, this? It's a documentary. I think it's like four or five episodes. I don't remember. Um, but basically, um, a few years ago in 
Massachusetts, they had two drug lab scandals um, where, you know, if you get arrested with drugs, they have to run the test on it so that when they take you to court, they can say, we know that this is cocaine. We ran the, the, the scientific test on it. This is cocaine, right? And if they can't prove that it's cocaine, then they, then technically they can't arrest you. So there was one lab like on the east side of Massachusetts, I think, where um, the woman... I don't want to. I don't want to get into that because I might have the places mm-hmm. wrong. But basically, okay. In one lab, the woman was just she was falsifying the documents. She wasn't running the tests. She would pick up like samples that looked the same and then run one test and apply the results to everything else. Um, she was like this like first generation um, Indian American woman. Um, and she was being, you know, like rewarded for doing so good. Everybody was like, wow, you're, you know, you're so great at your job. People should be as productive as you. Meanwhile, the other scientists were like, how can she be doing four times the work that we are doing? So they basically like, you know, pulled her out. She's the bad apple. They blamed everything on her, despite the fact that like, the system like this whole war on drugs the whole system is flawed and it encourages people to do these kinds of things then a few months later there was this woman this white woman who basically she was cooking crack like she was the the chemist in the lab and the drug samples would come in she was taking meth like liquid meth and when that when she didn't have access to that she would take the cocaine out of these um you know, out of the evidence baggies, and she would cook, like, she would make crack at her station, and she would, like, make her own crack pipes. She was smoking, like, 10, 12 times a day. Oh, my goodness. Bananas. And so now they're, they had to figure out what, what were they going to do with all of the people whose cases where she was the chemist on, right? Because now you're talking about somebody who was like impaired, um, who was tampering with drugs. Like they tested some stuff and it was like powdered sugar in the bag because she took the drugs out and replaced it with stuff. Like it was- Oh my goodness, that is nuts. Okay, that's definitely on the watch list for sure. Well, I think that kind of- kind of segues into the other conversation (laughs) that I wanted to have with you a little bit um and so one of the things I wanted to talk about was like structural and institutional racism and I wanted to talk about that and just kind of how it is impacting communities of color a little differently than it's impacting other communities and just, I think, like, throwing out there, they were saying that, like, 30% of the people in Louisiana who, you know, contracted uh, COVID-19 were, you know, Black people. And so, obviously, there's a higher, compared to, like, the Bay Area, there's a higher concentration of Black people in New Orleans than, than there are here. Um, but I definitely think that that has little to do with it, and I feel like the more structural, you know, the structural things like healthcare and like the lack of access to healthcare um, is one of the main reasons that, you know, communities of color and poorer communities are going to be impacted with this virus uh, more difficult or or, or harsher than other communities. But like, what are your thoughts on that? And can you kind of break that down since you're like a teacher and stuff? I definitely (laughs) break it down. Um, so, sorry, I had, like, this moment. What's that Janet Jackson song? She was just like, I'm going to break it down, break it down. Anyway. Um, yeah, I love that part, yeah. <laughs> anytime. Isn't it anytime? Yeah, wait. No. So, I get so lonely? Is that what it is? I get so lonely. I get so lonely. Yep. Um, so, this is, like, I do this with my students, and they're just like, they don't get it. They're like, what? Janet Jackson, who? We don't know that. We don't know that reference. Because we were born How in dare they? Three. <laughs> How dare they not know that reference? <laughs> um, so, 
so I think a lot what a lot of people are, are pointing out is that a lot of folks um, a lot of black people folks of color people in poor neighborhoods um, they have a lot more of these underlining health concerns that have weakened their immune system right higher rates of diabetes type 2 diabetes and things like that so um, but then what they don't bring into the conversation is exactly what you just said. Um, folks live in food deserts, you know what I'm saying? Like, um, I'm trying to think if you live in certain parts of, of Oakland, like if you live in, in West Oakland, you are miles and miles away from a grocery store. Um, if you don't have a car, how are, you know, how are you getting fresh produce? What kind of food, you know, what kind of food are you bringing into the home? Um, <clears throat> so without talking about the, the implications of, of poverty, of, you know, like you were saying, systemic racism that impacts, you know, people's, people's lives and, and ultimately their health, um, the amount of stress that people are under. So I think it's important to have that conversation. Like if we want to talk about dis disproportionality, we have to make sure that the conversation is, um, is as nuanced as possible and that it, 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 it brings in those factors. Otherwise it sounds as if like, you know, um, as if it, there's something pathologically wrong with say black people or poor people, you know what I mean? Or pe other people, other groups of, of um, POC. I think sometimes when we don't have those more nuanced conversations about systemic racism and structural inequalities, we present information as if there's something innately wrong with you know, these groups of people. And that's just not, not the case, you know? So true, and I think uh oh um that someone else has access to Trader Joe's in the same way, and that's just not true, like you said in parts of um in parts of Oakland you know, the nearest grocery store is miles and miles away. So how are people having access to the fruits and vegetables and the fresh foods that's going to help their immunity to these types of things? Like the things that are within, you know, walking distance are going to be those fast food restaurants and those things that are causing the, the type 2 diabetes or the heart problems or the this and the that, you know what I mean? And so I think that it's not only important, like you said, to give the stats and the data of like, okay, 30% of the, the patients with this virus in New Orleans were black people, but let's also look at the like so socio and economic issues that are sometimes buried underneath, but maybe not too far from the surface, you know? And I don't think that it takes that much um, digging to, to see that like maybe a student at your school who's having to deal with, you know, depression and the fact that their friend just got stabbed to death, you know what I mean? And maybe the fact that they don't have access to, to strong enough Wi-Fi to do their check-ins with you each day, you know what I mean? On top of maybe their mom being home and being stressed out and out of work, all of these things like compound the anxiety and, and the pressure that other people are under having to deal with this virus. It's not an even playing field. And when we do talk about stats and number and data, I think that sometimes, like you said, that nuanced information gets lost. Um, and I also think that it's important for us as women of color to not only educate and talk about this with each other, but also hopefully educate the people that are gonna be watching this hopefully invite them to do more information on that. And like you use the term food desert. I know what that means, but if someone doesn't know what that means, please look into that. That's um, what we were. Yeah. So I just think that these conversations are so important and that is exactly why I wanted to talk to you about it. Um, so what is a way that, you know, like 
there's so many parents that are now, you know, homeschooling and doing all of these things. What are some of the ways that parents can support you or people can support you as far as being a teacher? You know what I mean? Girl, I mean, you know, it's difficult because I teach high school. Keep your kids at home. <laughs> so some of my students, like I'm, I'm reading their, you know, their answers to these questions. And I'm like, wait, wait a minute you left that like where did you go why are you not like this is not this is not for play play you need to be at home you know um so that's one thing the other thing is um you know really just supporting students and like i think sometimes people we forget that that children that young people are people sometimes and so i think it's really important for parents to to stop and think okay i'm stressed out i'm overwhelmed my kid is stressed out my kid is overwhelmed you know um and i so i think that if if parents can create that kind of environment it's much easier you know when i'm when i'm trying to reach out and and talk to them i think it's it they're more um they're more willing to talk, you know what I mean? Because they don't have this, this extra pressure, um, you know, coming in. So I think, I I just think it's important for parents to be talking with their kids, um, to, to try and, you know, understand what they're feeling and, and listen to them. Um, I think that can go a really long, a long way. I agree. And that's kind of what I was saying before, as far as like, all these opportunities and all these traditions that these young adults are going to be missing out on. And it's important for us to acknowledge that and not to minimize that and not to minimize the things that they're experiencing as well, just because maybe they don't have a job or this or that, you know, I felt like, I think all of us felt that way as young adults that like our experience was being minimized and people didn't really, you know, care (laughs) about our issues as much. And so I think that, we're all going through some tough shit right now and it's important to validate each other more than ever. And so I definitely appreciate that. Um, And so now we are going to go into the rapid fire portion of this interview. And so I'm going to ask you five questions. um, And then I just want you to tell me like the first thing that comes to your mind. You know what I mean? Like don't think too quickly on it. Um, so if your life was a movie, what genre would it be and who would play you? Oh, it would definitely be a comedy. Um, and I would get, oh, Danielle Brooks. Is that her name from Orange is the New Black? Oh, my God. She would be I, perfect as you. I love her so much. Yes. Oh my God, that is such a good one, actually. That is a really good one. (laughs) Okay, no, that's a good one. Um, Okay, so if you were, okay, second question. If you were an ice cream flavor, what flavor would you be and why? Ooh. I would be like um, Moose Tracks, you know, because it's like on the surface, you know, it looks like just regular ice cream, but you dig in there. And you got some peanut butter cups. You got all this like different stuff going on. There's some chocolate running through there. So that is fire, girl. I love me <laughs> some moose tracks. Like I've only been able to get it at like actual ice cream parlors. Not like I haven't found it at the grocery store. But yes, moose tracks. That was such a good one. You're so good at this. Sorry, I have them written down. But you're okay. so good at this because you're getting some really good answers. Okay. So what is something that's on your life list? I call it a life list instead of a bucket list. Mm-hmm. What's one thing on your life list? Because it's like, I want to do these things while I'm living. I don't want to like do it right before I kick the bucket, you know? I, I like that. It just reframes it from something kind of negative. Like, oh, I better hurry up and do this before I die. So mm-hmm. like, hey, let me enjoy life while, you know, I, I, I like that. On my life list, what's on my life list? um honestly is just to do to do more traveling and to to live in the moment more um I'm a huge overthinker and so I'm usually like obsessing over 
something that happened in the past or obsessing over like creating these scenarios in my head and now I'm just like sitting on the bed crying like what did I just do to myself? <laughs> <laughs> so just like focusing on right here and right now and enjoying um enjoying the moment and like taking opportunities to travel and um and and not necessarily oh it's got to be this big grand thing but like oh you know um I just I I I went um to New Mexico you know what I mean like just just enjoying that kind of stuff more totally next question fourth question if you could buy any food if you could go, okay, no, if you could have any food delivered from Uber Eats right now, what would it be? Macaroni and cheese. I have been craving <laughs> macaroni and cheese ever since I came back from the grocery store like two weeks ago. And I was like, why didn't I get provisions for macaroni and cheese? <laughs> <laughs> I'm very upset about it. And I was like, what? Well, I'm there's nothing I can do until like it's time to re up and go back out to the grocery store. So I've just been waiting. So next week I'm going to make some macaroni and cheese. Lots of mac and cheese. How, so how do you make yours? Do you just make it on the stove or do you put it in the oven at the end? Like what's your, girl, because you know, girl, I'll be putting mine in the oven girl. So what do you do? With, I'm I'm traditional. I'm gonna make I'm gonna make that cheese roux on the stove. I'm gonna put mm -hmm. it up so it can bake. We're gonna do this right. Yes, girl. See, I need to come get you need to Uber Eats me some of that mac and cheese when you <laughs> make it, girl, because that's the good way. That's how I make mine too. You make the cheese sauce on the stove. Yes. And then I put the macaroni in there and then you sprinkle the cheese on top so it has like the crunchy crust on top, girl. Yes. Okay, so Fifth and but final question. Sad, Sorry, go ahead. I will take, I will eat other types of macaroni and cheese. Like, I know what's the best kind, but I will probably eat a bowl of craft too because, you know, <laughs> there's like, a time and a place for everything. Exactly. Definitely. I did grow up on that Easy Mac too, the like little <laughs> microwavable one. Do you remember that? Don't play me, girl. You know you had I'll that Easy Mac. <laughs> okay, so fifth and final question. Once this is all over, where is your first trip? Go your first trip? Oh, to visit my family, to visit my family, oh. to see my 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 nieces. I mean, like not like family, like fat girls traveling, like trip. Like, where are we going? Oh, okay. are we getting so are we getting our bikinis? Are we getting like sweaters? We're going to snow. Like, where are we going? Definitely somewhere where I can wear a bathing suit. Yes. Um, I've been trying to get back to, to Hawaii. I went like, I don't know, maybe three summers ago. So definitely somewhere with lots of sun. I miss feeling the sun. Like it's so gray and ugly out here. So definitely somewhere with the sun and water and a beach. Yeah. Oh, I cannot wait. My, well, my plan was to move to Bali this year. Um, and so that's still my plan. It's going to be happening, like, obviously later in the year. Yeah. Um, but I want to be... Like, permanently? Well, I can only get, like, a year visa. But okay. that's, the, that's the first plan is to go for a year and then kind of see. Because um, I don't want to be based in the U.S. I do want to be based in Asia. And so uh, Bali is, as of before, pre-COVID... Bali was like the most flexible as far as me being able to work virtually and have a visa to live there. Um, yeah. But we're going to see kind of what happens with this. But uh, once that's all sorted, girl, come to Bali. We'll go to the beach. Like I'm ready for it. You can go to Hawaii and then come holler at your girl <laughs> in Bali because I cannot wait. And that like, that's amazing. my, that's my first trip. And I'm going to just stay because you don't know what's going to happen. You know what I mean? So I'm going to just stay in Bali until they, like, put me out because... Until they kick you out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, girl, because I'm ready. Like, it's difficult as someone for, like me that travels full-time to, like, yeah. have to stay in one place, you know? But I know it's for the safety and, like, it's not a problem. But I'm definitely, like, ready and excited to get to my next destination. 
I mean, I know this might be something for a later conversation, but I would just be interested, like, what's happening with the other, like, fat girls traveling trips? Like, I know they were supposed to be, you know, fat camp and what, like, the cat skills and stuff like that. And then Cuba and one other place in, in the Midi. Jordan. Yeah. yeah, yeah so yeah. I did cancel fat camp uh, Finger Lakes wine country. Oh. Which okay, was a I don't bummer. Know the cat I don't even know where that no, is. it's it's upstate New York. That's fine. No, it's the okay. same pretty much. <laughs> um, no, so I did cancel Fat Camp. Um, I reached out to the campers and kind of asked what they would want to do if they wanted to postpone or if they wanted a refund. And they wanted a refund, which I totally understand because like we're all worried about money and stressed out, and who knows, maybe they got laid off or whatever. You know what I mean? So figuring that out and just letting the speakers know and everything that like you know we're at first I was like maybe we can postpone it but as we started this conversation saying like Newsom just said that like we're sheltering until June at this point um and so to keep postponing it is really stressful for me um I am still confident though that the trips I have later in the year are still going to be able to move forward it's um Jordan in October and Cuba in September. Um, yeah. And so both of those companies that I'm going with are still planning to do those trips as of now. And then if things change, then obviously those things will get canceled or yeah. pushed back and people will get refunded or whatever they choose. But that has definitely been a struggle for me as someone that does plan events and host events and, you know, I do that and then I do like freelance writing and, and a bunch of different things, but it's a lot to do with travel. Um, and so that has been a huge hit for me, like financially, but just realistically, I personally don't think that it's safe to bring a bunch of women into New York state right now with, you know, you know, the, uh, the coronavirus, you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> I, you know what I mean? So it's not, <laughs> it's not a center of travel. First, so I like, no, yeah, I was, was, was going to say coronavirus. I just like the virus part. <laughs> but you can't say the virus part without the corona. You know what I mean? But yeah, my little Cardi B impersonation. <laughs> but uh, I wouldn't feel comfortable bringing women into New York State on a non-essential event. You know what I mean? And so that's a responsible thing to do. Um, it was planned for May. And I don't know what the stuff is in New York right now, their shelter in place thing. A couple weeks ago, I talked to someone who lived there and it was just for two weeks, but I don't think yeah. that people are really allowed out in New York yet either. And we're here in the Bay area and we're not out either. So I just don't, I think that's the safest route. And I honestly still think that it, it might still be shelter in place by the time that we were even going to have it moved back to. So unfortunately that is, you know, taking a pretty big hit on my you know business but luckily i have other options and figuring things out as we go i think a lot of us are in the same boat and that kind of gives me some hope that we're all kind of just figuring this shit out as we go because like this all just kind of landed on us and we're all just kind of doing the best that we can you know okay yeah so yeah, as of right now, Fat Camp was canceled. The other trips are still going to go forward, but I was going to, you know, potentially be hosting a Fat Camp this summer. I'm not going to be doing that. I just don't think that people would honestly have the funds. I don't know that I would even have the funds myself to attend Fat Camp if... You know what I mean? <laughs> so I don't want to, as a business, go be promoting something that people can't actually attend you know on top of that who knows if it's even going to be possible you know and so for me as an entrepreneur that's something that I'm just going to have to put on the back burner um for right now which is a huge bummer because you came to camp last year and it was so fun that's oh how we God. met oh and so I'm heartbroken that I can't yeah. do fat camp this year but it's just it's just not meant to be this year but I can do it next year and that'll be fine I mean, it definitely people's health is, is much more important, but it's definitely, um, like you said, like a real bummer. Um, cause a lot of people are looking forward to that, to that, like 
type of community but I think with like hosting conversations like this and like the different you know the ways that you interact on the um you know on social your different social media platforms I think it's um it's really great that you're trying to create some you know still create a community for folks um so that they don't feel you know so that we don't feel so isolated you know and um, bored <laughs> Quite Thank great. you. Yeah, I'm trying to create some fun activities and opportunities to connect and even share like previous travel stuff. But honestly, like I created the group originally for me, because I wanted to connect with other fat travelers. And like, every time I do try to do something fun or try to create something, it's always like, would I do this? You know what I mean? And like, is this something that I would have needed? Um, and I do think that it's important for us to still have that sense of community and to be doing these zoom calls. And, um, I want to create like an actual, not necessarily program, but like some structure around the things that I'm doing. Like at first I was doing these like Instagram lives, which were so fun, but not necessarily sustainable for me in the long term when I'm having to try to have meetings with brands and trying to like figure out what's going on with my business. You know, I can't do my schedule just isn't that flexible. But doing something like this, like a Zoom meeting and talking with you and talking with other members and seeing how people are coping, but just like what's really happening in their real life, I think will be important. And I want to do more like happy hours and different things like that, you know, but I want to give it some real thought. And like, I was like, oh, that might be cool to do like a virtual fat camp. But I just don't think that like fat camp translates over the internet. Like it's really about like, being there you know what I mean so I'm still trying to figure out a way to create that not the fat camp experience but be able to share some of the information and to be able to share um that connection with each other because I feel like I learn so much at fat camp just like with the group chats that we have and people sharing their stories and their experiences I've been able to learn so much and I think that's part of the magic of fat camp but also part of it is actually being there and like, you know, swimming in the pool and the pool parties and the food and all of that stuff. And so I want to create something where we can still talk about this type of shit, you know, but also talk about fatness and some of our experiences that we're having to deal with, be like because of our bodies and because we're in this situation. Um, I just want to find the right way to do that. But I think that, like, with each conversation that we have, like, we're all going to be talking about our bodies and all that kind of shit anyway, you know, because that's what we do. Agree. Yay. Well, I'm so happy that we could have this conversation. <laughs> thank you so yeah, much for your you time, for Erica. Of course. You're I just want to give people, I just want to give people a better look at, like, what's really going on in the education system right now and how things are so much different for not just the students, but also the teachers I think we're hearing so much of the media and especially in social media, a lot of um, conversation from the parents, you know, um, yeah. and how they're coping with this. But um, I think it's important to hear how the teachers are coping, how their lives have had to change drastically and also get a, a little look into what's happening with the students. So thank you for sharing that. And yeah, we'll definitely keep in touch and I'll keep you in the loop on all the stuff that's going on. All right. Bye. Bye.